Well, good afternoon. Welcome to all of our visitors. It's great to see you this afternoon. Our text before the lesson is Psalm 58. Psalm 58, verses 1 through 11. Psalm 58, 1 through 11. These are God's words. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No, in your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or of the cunning enchanter. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can fill the heat, can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. Please be seated. Psalm 58 is a paradigmatic example of what scholars call an imprecatory psalm or prayer. A call for God to pour out his judgment upon the wicked. A prayer for cursing. And there are a number of such prayers in the psalms, as many as 14, with imprecatory elements being found in many others, as many as 40 of the Psalms. Even the beloved Psalm 139, which begins, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar, ends with, O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. An imprecatory prayer is a kind of lament, a crying out of God's people in the face of injustice where the petitioners are begging God to intervene, to vindicate their innocence, and to keep his promise to enact vengeance upon those who threaten to defile his holy kingdom. It is a cry for God, in other words, to demonstrate his righteousness, that he is a just judge who rewards the good and punishes the evil. Listen again to verses 10 and 11 of Psalm 58. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Now for modern sensibilities, such vengeful language can seem more vicious than virtuous. And so many Christians today wonder what to make of these cursing psalms. And for churches like ours who wish to return to a more traditional expression of corporate worship, one that would include the reading and singing of the Psalter, which we will do uh, later in the service, the question arises as to whether we should incorporate the imprecatory passages in our praise. As Christians, can we really in good conscience ask God to bring vengeance upon our enemies? Because are we not, as Jesus commanded us, to love our enemies and not curse them? Can we pray these prayers? 
can we sing these psalms? I wish to make the argument that not only can we sing them and pray them, but that we must do so. And I mean must in this sense, that by ignoring these texts, it has helped and it will continue to help perpetuate a distortion, not only in our own moral intuitions and our own sensibilities, moral sensibilities, but also a distortion in our cultural ethos, where mercy is viewed apart from the lens of justice. According to scripture, God's mercy and justice are bound together. Indeed, it is the Psalter who gives us perhaps the most provocative illustration of this union by casting these two virtues of mercy and justice, along with truth and peace, as thwarted lovers who rendezvous on a street in the holy city with a kiss. A holy matrimony which unfortunately our contemporary culture has tried to tear asunder, struggling as they might to keep mercy while putting away justice, which is a little like trying to divorce your wife while retaining her services as a cook. Good luck with that. That will not do. You cannot have one without the other, in other words, justice and mercy, and that's because mercy, in fact, presupposes justice. And yet a number of prominent Christians have taken a very different view of the imprecatory Psalms. They tend to be more modern Christians, but they've taken a different view, arguing that they should not be part of a Christian's prayer life or the worship of the church. And perhaps the most famous among them is C.S. Lewis. At this point, it might be best for me just to sit down rather than to argue against C.S. Lewis, but I'll give it a shot anyway. In his work, Reflections on the Psalms, Lewis wrote this concerning the imprecatory text. We must not either try to explain them away or to yield for one moment to the idea that because it comes in the Bible, all this vindictive hatred must somehow be good and pious. We must face both facts squarely. The hatred is there, festering, gloating, undisguised. And also we should be wicked if we in any way condoned or approved it. For Lewis, as Reese Laverty has pointed out, the cursing Psalms function in scripture the same way that David's adultery with Bathsheba functions, as an exemplar of human weakness as an example of what not to do. Meaning that the venting of the psalmist spirit in these texts represents unholy speech and should therefore be considered as reprehensible and unworthy of emulation as the feckless advice of Job's comforters or perhaps even the tempting uh, words of Satan in the wilderness. I would guess, though, that most conservative Christians, and likely Lewis himself, would be rather uncomfortable with where such an interpretive method ends if we were to apply it consistently. For one thing, it sets a bad precedent of rejecting the plain reading of the text. The Psalms are essentially an inspired hymn book, a collection of divinely appointed songs to be used as an aid to worship. Indeed, the Apostle Paul himself commands us directly, he exhorts us to sing these holy hymns to one another. Meaning that we are to follow David's thoughts and the other uh, psalmists uh, after them as we read and sing these psalms, the words of which often express the desires of our hearts better than we ourselves can. But not every emotion found in them is to be esteemed, says Lewis. For some express perverse affections, a prideful spirit of festering and gloating hatred. But if such is the case, then one might wonder what the exact criterion is by which we would determine which parts of the Psalms are positive exemplars and which 
are not. It certainly would have to be something more than just that they offend our moral sensibilities. Because after all, is not scripture supposed to shape our moral intuitions and not our moral intuitions to shape scripture? And where is this rejection of the unsavory Old Testament speech supposed to end? Should we also classify the triumphant song of Moses in Exodus 15, which was read to us as hate speech? Or Deborah's song that's very similar in Judges chapter 5? I think most Christians would say certainly not. Another modern approach to taming the imprecatory psalms comes from Tim Keller, more recent um, Christian thinker, pastor. In his psalms devotional, he discusses Psalm 69, part of which says this, it's verses 22 through 28. Let their own table before them become a snare, speaking of their enemies, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them be enrolled among the, let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Here is part of Keller's commentary on this text. The psalmist prays that his betrayers be damned. Verses 22 through 28. How do we read this? First, this startles us into feeling something of the desperation that produced it, keeping us from being complacent about injustice in the world. But the foreshadowing of Jesus' suffering, verses 4, 7, and 21, reminds us we stand in a different place from the psalmist, on the other side of the cross. Stephen looked at Jesus for vindication, not retribution, and prayed for his enemies as they killed him, Acts 7, 54 through 60, as did Jesus himself, Luke 23, 34. The psalmist is right to want judgment on evil, but Jesus takes it himself. This forever changes our view of our own deserts and the way we seek justice. Keller's view, much like the rest of his theology, struggles to find a disburdening middle ground on the subject. He argues that it's okay for David to pray these prayers, but it's not okay for Christians. For we have been shown a better way through the teaching of Jesus. An approach that, as Reese Laverty has argued, will be appealing for many evangelicals, and that's because Keller's argument, besides from providing an inoffensive alternative for modern sensibilities, also relies upon a familiar law-gospel dynamic. That if the psalmist just had known the gospel, the reasoning goes, had he realized how everyone is a sinner and that all of us deserve divine punishment, he would have been inclined to ask God to forgive his oppressors instead of condemning them just as Stephen and Jesus had done. That while on the one hand, the psalmist cries for vengeance should stir within us a desire for justice, on the other hand, it must not stir in us a desire for God to enact that justice, but instead for him to be merciful. And there is a sense, of course, in which this is very much right. When we pray imprecatory prayers, it should be in the vein of, if they will not repent, then strike them down. But it should not be, Father, ignore the suffering of the innocent so that we might give those who are wicked a little longer in order to repent, as Keller seems to suggest. Keller's presentation of the biblical data is also too one-sided. Because it's not just in the Old Testament, it's not that neat, not even close. It's not just in the Old Testament where we find this kind of imprecation. We find it all over the New Testament. 
Indeed, the apostles and New Testament authors freely apply imprecatory psalms in their own context, in the Christian context. In fact, as Laverty notes, they apply the very verses that Keller says that, should, that we should not apply. For example, speaking about the death of Judas in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, Peter applies Psalm 69, verse 25, which we just read, as well as Psalm 109, verse 8, which is another imprecatory psalm. When he says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his place. Peter is referring to the imprecatory psalms that talk about judgment that comes against those who go against God's covenant. And he's saying, This is why Judas is dead. He went against God's covenant, and he's rightly been struck down. So the justice justice that's come upon Judas, according to Peter, is right and good. Which means that being on the other side of the cross doesn't stop the apostles from taking imprecatory psalms at face value. Indeed, we find numerous New Testament references to these imprecatory psalms. We could add to this, of course, that Jesus himself calls down woes of judgment upon the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. And Paul pronounces anathema upon all those who preach another gospel in Galatians 1, 8 through 9. And listen to this. The martyrs in heaven petition God to avenge their blood in Revelation 6, 10. Now, a second point is that Keller's approach, like Lewis's, when we apply it consistently, ends in whitewashing way too much of Scripture. In fact, it would whitewash all of those passages that I just referenced. Let me quote Laverty uh, in full on this subject. He writes this, If we view Old Testament believers as suboptimally gracious because they had not had the fullness of the gospel revealed to them, then likewise should we shy away from Moses' song because Christ was drowned in the Red Sea of judgment for us at the cross? Should we find better words than Deborah's because Jesus was pierced for our transgressions with the tent peg of God's wrath? Again, I don't think any of us stand there thinking, oh Moses, if only you had known a better way to pray. I mean, should we cringe at these prayers of triumph? I think not. Again, the principle is this. I think those explanations are just too easy, right? It's just too easy. We have to hold to the principle of Scripture, which is that mercy and justice are bound together in God's nature. A disposition which, on the one hand, takes no pleasure in the destruction of his enemies. Exodus 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Indeed, it's a disposition that weeps at their demise, as Jesus lament over the rebellion of his people demonstrates where he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I wish I could gather to you as a hen gathers her chicks. But at the same time, it's also a disposition that rejoices when justice is done. Revelation 19 speaks of all of heaven rejoicing when God's vengeance is poured out. Talk about offending modern sensibilities. Listen to this. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just, for He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cry out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. This divine disposition where justice and mercy, where grieving and rejoicing embrace, by the way, was also present in David himself. The man who many modern evangelicals say didn't understand God's nature well enough to pray without sinning. 
In Psalm 3, the king is on the run from his treasonous son, Absalom. And during that, he prays this, starting in verse 1. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Drop down to verse 7. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. The idea there is to punch someone in the jaw. Notice what it says next. You break the teeth of the wicked. This is who you are, God. And David is crying out to him, Arise, O Lord, and bring vengeance upon my enemies. And yet, when Absalom is killed, when that judgment is poured out upon him, what does David do? He laments. 2 Samuel 18, 33. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he wept, he, as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would that I have died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Notice that this is the exact same heart that you find in the Apostle Paul, who wept for his kinsmen in the flesh who had rebelled against God. Paul said, I wish that I myself could be cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my king, uh, kinsmen. That's how the Apostle mourned concerning their impending death. So our desire, on the one hand, must be for the wicked to repent and to live. But the fulfillment of that desire cannot come at the cost of despising justice. We must desire mercy, but that desire can't come at the cost of justice, of just permitting unbridled unrighteousness. It must not come at the cost of allowing evil to reign and the innocent to be destroyed. We might put it this way, Christ has already died. A sacrifice once and for all, Scripture says, so we don't need to keep offering up innocence to give more time for the wicked to repent if we are given that option. Ignoring justice so that mercy may abound, which has been the approach of many, to give you an illustration, to make this more concrete. It has, that has been the approach, I believe, of many in the church concerning the transing of children in our culture, the destruction of their bodies and of their souls. The numbers now are 100,000 have been on puberty blockers. I think that's grossly underestimated. But that, I mean, the, the number that have been fed this ideology and believe it in their mind is ginormous. But about this subject, so many pastors remain silent and still to this day say nothing about it. And when challenged on their silence, they punt to evangelism. Now, they may do this because they're cowards and they're afraid to speak out because it will, you know, they think destroy their ministry, it will shrink their church or ruin their influence or their neighbors won't like them anymore. That may be the real reason. But even if we take them at their word, when they say, well, no, for evangelism, we can't. They warned us that moralizing over sins like transgenderism will needlessly offend gospel prospects and therefore compromise the church's witness. So for the sake of the good news, we must turn away as children are butchered. It's the idea. Because, you know, the best way to win souls to righteousness is to neglect it. But as I say often, and if I die soon, you can put this on my tombstone, okay? And you, I won't, you, you won't have to ask me, you'll know, because I say it a lot. The end of the gospel is peace on earth. A peace which comes when justice rolls down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. The only way to win people to such justice is to uphold it. So it's never mercy at the neglect of justice. But neither is it justice at the neglect of mercy. When you pray these imprecatory prayers, when you sing these songs, you cannot do so in the spirit of Jonah. Jonah so despised his enemies, the Ninevites, he so despised them that rather than taking them the warning that God had given him so that they might repent, he ran away. In fact, he rather died 
than bring the good news to the Ninevites. He'd rather die than the Ninevites live. Which, notice, is the exact opposite of David's heart and Paul and, of course, Jesus. The spirit of Jonah. It's justice at the neglect of mercy. So it's neither mercy at the neglect of justice nor justice at the neglect of mercy. The divine disposition gives equal weight to both, and so must we. And I'm not saying there's not a tension that's there. And there aren't times where we struggle and we're not sure how to navigate that. But you can't minimize one to make it easy. You can't take... 40 psalms and set them aside. You can't take the book of Revelation and set them aside. You can't take large chunks of the New Testament and set it aside, or the Old Testament, because it's easier. God's justice and His mercy, we have to hold on to both of those, and both of those must be in our own soul. And I don't think it's 50-50. I think it's 100-100. And this is why the reading and singing of the complete psalmody is so important. Because to neglect these texts is going to distort our sensibilities. Because in the psalms, what we have are divinely inspired expressions of emotion. Holy lament and joy and anxiety and peace and regret and love and hate. You might think of it this way. If we want to understand the doctrine of justification, we must go to Paul's letter to the Romans. But if we want to properly cultivate our affections, knowing what and how to feel, we must go to the Psalms, to the entire catalog. Which is to say to parents, don't just teach your kids Proverbs, right? which tells them how to act, but teach them the Psalms so they know how to feel. It's not just knowing what to do and what not to do. It's also knowing what to love and what to hate. I mean, imagine this. What would happen if we only sang the imprecatory psalms and neglected the hymns of praise and thanksgiving and and the songs about the glory and eternality of God's kingdom and covenant and the triumph of His righteousness and His everlasting mercy? What would become of us if we never read or sang Psalm 19, for example? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. What would happen to us if we never read prayed or sang Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. The neglect of imprecatory psalms has perpetuated and will continue to perpetuate a distortion, not only in our own moral intuition, but in our cultural ethos where mercy is viewed apart from the lens of justice, where sentimental niceness and politeness has become the norming norm, which makes, by the way, a people very susceptible to tyrants. You only have to study history to know this, this perpetual peacekeeping that's always willing to compromise a little bit. You know, this Neville Chamberlain approach to statecraft is just setting you up to be taken over by a tyrant. But as kingdom citizens, we are to yearn for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our desire should be for the return of God's kingdom in its fullness. Come quickly, Lord, is the prayer of the saints. And in praying and singing these psalms, we are giving expression to that desire. But that coming, by the way, brings judgment. We should desire that judgment when all will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power 
and coming on the clouds of heaven. And we should look forward to it with anticipation, ready to rejoice in it. But we should also desire to save as many as we can from it. Those two desires are not contradictory. They are the gospel. And to lose one is to lose the other.